All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome and welcome back to Cultures of the Crisis, the lecture series in which members of the chair group European Culture and Literature at the University of Groningen present cultural studies perspectives on Corona and beyond. My name is Florian Lippert, and I will be your moderator for today's session. And I'm joined by Vera Alexander, who is in charge of managing participation today. Thank you very much again, Vera, for taking this over. Today's lecture is the first of several upcoming lectures from members of this chair group that deal with COVID-19 in Latin American context. So first today, here and now, my great colleague Elizabeth Pinilla Duarte will talk about Latin American online narratives of the COVID-19 crisis. Directly afterwards, those of you who were lucky enough to get a ticket will listen to the chair of the chair group, Professor Pablo Valdivia, and his presentation on cultural narratives of crisis and migration, and can watch a photo exhibition before that lecture, which was put together for this specific occasion. Unfortunately, that event is organized, well, not unfortunately, that event is organized by our fantastic colleagues at the University of Antioquia, so it's not part of this lecture series, Culture of the Crisis, and unfortunately, uh, places for that event were limited and it was fully booked very quickly, but there will be a recording available linked on our chair group website, so uh, watch out for that. And thirdly, we will have another extremely interesting lecture on Latin American contexts coming up next week within our Cultures of the Crisis series, so same time, same virtual place, on the effects of COVID-19 on Latin American prisons. For details, please check our website. If you don't know the website yet, simply Google Cultures of the Crisis Groningen. So now, to part one of our Latin America mini series, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you my dear colleague Elizabeth Pinilla Duarte, who is a PhD candidate at the Graduate School for the Humanities here at the University of Groningen. Elizabeth was awarded a prestigious PhD scholarship abroad by the program Colciencias Minciencias in Colombia. She has worked as a lecturer in the field of culture and narratives. Her main research interests are online narratives and other interrelations between communication and technology, as well as theories of language and cognition and the field of public opinion. She is currently conducting research on narratives and online expressions of public opinion during the Colombian post-accord time. So, dear Elizabeth, uh, welcome once more. Great that you're in for this, and I hand over to you. Hi, Dorian. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this series. Uh, so, because of the time I have, uh, I will uh, start right away. Thank you to everybody for joining also. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, my lecture is called Exclusion versus Solidarity Online Narratives of the Crisis in Latin America. So, going back to normality is one of the main wishes of millions around the world. Some of them, because of the lack of mobility due to lockdowns, is making them crazy. And many others, because of the lack of basic means to survive for something else that I would call here inequality. The escalate is a concept that, that of what some governments like Spain are using to go back to a new normality, as they call it now. Because closing everything was easier than opening again, mainly for the, mainly for the uncertainty of the paths the virus could take or draw. So the governments plan to the de-escalation step by step, and probably after the harm the virus causes in Latin America, governors of several countries will follow this referent as well. Being in Spain is a country quite affected by the, by the virus in Europe, the notion of the escalation seems appropriate to refer to something that needs the progressive reduction of something that is dangerous. What I just is abstract, I know, and I'm gonna say it in even more abstract terms. Because I want you to think of what could replace the abstraction. 
So I would call it P needs Q. So the question for you is what could be replacing P here and what could be replacing Q? If we think of the terms I just mentioned, we can notice that many of them refer to movement, and movement is related to space. We move in the physical space and we have terms to refer to movement to orientate in the world. In this regard, we could say that communication is a way to activate spaces of relations in the construction of shared meaning. It's a way to produce and reproduce space. Communication is a way of making relations of space by producing space. So the understanding of how the production of spaces take place is relevant to comprehend how rhetoric projects are inscribed in modes of spatialization, modes of articulating narrative orders, and in this regard, modes of orientation. According to Handorf, uh, narratives intervene and modify spaces of relations. So in this sense, technologies act as agent systems, located systems, and act for us and upon us. So one question would be how these uh, relations are made in the space of, relation, of relations of the virtual. How rhetoric are inscribed in modes of specialization, modes of articulating narrative orders, and in this regard, modes of orientation. How this happen on the virtual? This question is important because on the one hand, even though the use of this technology requires at least basic learned techniques to use it, the possibilities users have to orienting and positioning in the worlds virtually allocated are linked to experience of the physical world. And we use this bodily and primary experience to navigate in the more abstract worlds of the virtual. On the other hand, because while trying to make space relationships, we also try to allocate ourselves and position on the basis of a scale time notion. Of course, the access to technologies is still very asymmetric, and while many don't have access to physical devices, others, due to lockdown, again, had to start to learn how to deal with it very quick. Let's think of, for example, teachers. If we go back to the exercise I proposed, let's say that we replace P for teachers. What would the escalation mean for them? Why would be Q? For now, I would like to say that communication is a means of space making through which positioning is effectuated. The notion of positioning has to do with the production of subjectivities. How is the production of subjectivity during this time of uncertainty in Latin America? On the one side, we could say that today, more than ever, these subjectivities are linked to emotions of uncertainty and fear not only because of the virus, but for the escalation of actions took by governors that reflected the big inequalities among societies and communities, and also because of the consequences, different narratives they are making ostentation of. On the other side, but very linked to the first one, the expression and production of subjectivities are now more than ever, let's say, in a redundant way, connected action. The lack of movement to construct relations in the physical space has been replaced in a very high scale by the possible relations people can make on the virtual and again from asymmetric positions. Now we could think of students. If P is a student, what do they need in terms of de-escalation? What is Q? The relations that make in the space of the virtual is feel now with super mega doses of information to cope with their fear while information injects more fear. But at the same time, actions of solidarity are done by ordinary people, like the one, the recent article by Jacqueline Fox. This article is about 
a young guy that belongs to a Peruvian indigenous community and who is also a student in the big city. And his concern for his community during the lockdown made him start to collect resources for the community. And actions like that one are made everywhere in Latin America. And I would post that here that those are representative of solidarity because we can see a concern for the other. Even though neo, neo, neoliberalism and its discourses for good about otherness is undeniable that we are because of the other. But some policies of the governors in Latin America ignore that premise. And their connection to social media is many times worse than what a profiteer would do. Because instead of leading, what they are doing is the act of misleading with the immediate conse consequence of endangering the lives of thousands. Virtual narratives like the ones of social media, like Twitter, are different from the traditional ones in that the first, as Mary Lord Ryan posits, develop in real time. They are not retrospective in the sense that they are, they, they don't, they are not seen from the perspective of the end. And in this narration, in the making, not only the plot or content is important, but also the attribution of plans and goals to the agents. Sorry. Governors are very clear of the possibilities of this kind of attribution. But I would like to relate this concept to a one more methodological concept as the Valachek's one, notion of discourse coalitions, to know about the role of agency agency in distributing influential ideas. Discourse coalitions are groups of actors who share a social construct. So what the author tries to know, to make with that a notion of discourse coalitions is how the, agent, the, the join, the link between agency and concepts uh, produce influential ideas and how those influential ideas produce actions in the social. So one of the countries that is currently doing worse with the contention of the virus is Brazil. And beyond of the fact that Brazil has a very large population, many believe that the misleading actions of Bolsonaro were one of the causes of this situation. Even though Bolsonaro was banned by Brazilian army to take political actions, and Twitter has erased some of his videos and tweets for considering, con considering them endangering, endangering to citizens', citizens health, the making sense of the state of affairs of this uh, state of affairs can be deduced in part by the tracking of his positioning published and promoted in the virtual. Of course. As everybody knows, Bolsonaro's view is very attached to Trump's. This is, for example, one tweet that, a tweet that he posted in March uh, the 3rd, uh, when he was like making some negotiations with Trump. Uh, and the, uh, so he is very attached to negative uh, denial to follow the lockdown advance. So taking advantage of the inequalities Brazilians experience and the need of many of the citizens to work to be able to survive every day, he led the creation of a hashtag on Twitter called Brazil No Pode Parar, which means Brazil can't stop. So while, while many Brazilians went to the streets to protest against the lockdowns, many others participated in Twitter by following the hashtag, uh, th this hashtag and the hashtag by Bolsonaro. In the own account of Bolsonaro, he wrote this kind of tweets. Worse than being defeated is the shame of not having fought. Unemployment, hunger, and misery will be the feature of those who support the tyranny of total isolation. One other is virtual meeting with the largest employers in Brazil. This scenario is worrying a devastated economy will directly affect health. If we truly value life and well-being, we must avoid an even greater disaster than the virus. Health and food on the table go together. 
So uh, based on these on these tweets and on this tendency, I checked the the tweets uh, that were linked to the hashtag Brazil no puede parar. And uh, so it, it was of around 2,500 tweets. So in a very first view, we can see some co concepts that are related there. So, for example, we 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 have in the center Brazil na pode parar that is uh, very related to Jair Bolsonaro, but it, it's also related to Morte, uh, and of course is uh, related to chloroquine, chloroquina in Spanish, uh, salva vidas, chloroquine, uh, save lives. Mm. And in this sense, if we do a, another kind of approach to these connections, we can a, quickly see some clusters there in those concepts, among those concepts. If we do like a more a, um, extract from there, like more a, the most important concepts, there is a still a, the connection between the words or concepts morte, that means that chloroquine salva, salva vidas, mm, testimonio, that means testimonio. So in this regard, what uh, well, Bolsonaro was until last week uh, very obsessed with uh, the chloroquine and Chloroquina, but this week he changed because again he was banned by Twitter and, for example, the hashtag uh, Brazil uh, can stop uh, is not is not is not followed anymore, as well as uh, Twitter took some actions against uh, Trump's tweeters because they are considering that those Twitter's tweets, uh, Bolsonaro's tweets are endangering endangering people's lives but in the meantime in the in the in the in the real world to call it a somehow right now people uh, are very influenced by those ideas and that's why also they are going to the streets and they are uh, protesting against lockdowns so we understand that uh, many of them they really need to work to get the food to survive every day to pay the rent, but many others are just following the the like the narratives posed by a capitalism and neoliberalism and ultra right wing discourses. Mm. So the notion of the word morte that is connected to uh, the virus by the idea that the undertext, this first one, is that the lockdown could kill more people. It's not the virus, but the lockdown, the lockdown. In this regard, Brazilian narratives and actions against lockdown are leading exclusion in the sense that, as it has happened in many other countries, the poor and the more fragile people, the social structure, are the ones that most at risk put their lives. And this is to save the economy, to save to save free elections, uh, but more importantly, and before they don't have any choice to survive. Well, one different example is uh, that one of Cuba, which has been widely seen as a solidarity country for welcoming an English ship in March with people infected with the virus and for sending doctors to different countries to help with the infected with the virus. Cuba is a country with a very controlling government and poverty and inequalities are also in the everyday lives of most of the population. In this regard, access to the virtual is not so common as in other places. And just in 2019, 2019, people could pay a server to have free access to the internet. But in any case, but in any case expression 
uh, of people is observed and, uh, by the government and controlled. On the other side, it has also been denounced that the Cuban government charges the countries of the countries for the doctors with high fees. For example, if doctors go to Italy, well, the Cuban government charges um, Italy uh, for, uh, I don't know, $5,000, $10,000. And, uh, and it's the same with other countries that are supposed to be uh, not as poor as as well. But it is also supposed that the uh, Cuban, Cuban government send their doctors to poor countries and they don't have to pay for the fee. So, besides, this retribution, monetary retribution, is not given to the doctors, but is collected by the government. But beyond this, it is a fact that Cuban doctors have been in many countries, some of them very poor, as I just said, and they recognized and even postulated to an all price, if I am not wrong, for at least it was in the discussion, yesterday, public discussion. So the hashtag I could follow for this lecture is the one by the government, Cuba. Salvavidas. Okay, here we, we have it in the center. It's Cuba Salvavidas, which means Cuba uh, saves lives. And uh, of course, this, this hashtag was also posted and, um, by the government and they injected a lot of money to make this, this, this uh, hashtag work. So I collected uh, 15,538 tweets and the concepts we, we see here, uh, the relation of concepts are these ones, for example. Um, we can see words like, we are Cuba. Mm. Health. Doctors, endeavor, country, uh, cubes, cube saves. Mm. For now. So they don't have a solidarity, of course, is around there. So of course, uh, we, if we compare to the to the to the cluster of uh, of the Twitter uh, Brazilian tweeters tweets, uh, we don't have some words here like death, for example. We don't have here uh, the word. Um, go back to work and we are not, uh, we don't see that the saving of lives is due to a uh, medicine that is not uh, already quite approved by doctors and who, and who, for example, that is the chloroquine. So we have another, all the other concepts that are more, that belong more to community, but of course we know that they are uh, uh, like spread by the government. So in a more uh, small cluster, I see that we can see that Cuba uh, says is, is very linked to another uh, cons or an hashtag that is we are continuity and Cuba is held in this moment of of the virus, but also, and due to the context of the country, we see that these concepts are related to other ones that mm, make, for example, that other countries didn't uh, receive the doctors sent by the Cuban government. So for example, this, uh, uh, the first concept revolution that is, uh, very connected to the leftist idea and socialism and communism may is also very present in the of course in the hashtags and in the tweets spread by the government. 
So there is one mm, concept that I am studying right now that is love, amor, and uh, the connections between uh, Cuba saves and uh, Cuba uh, doctors as heroes are connected to the semantic field of love in which love is also a fight and is, it means also suffering. So in the end, I, I, I don't want to uh, defend any of, of these narratives, but only uh, discuss about the narratives are, are um, spread in the arenas of the virtual right now. Um, so according to Saussure, meaning is constructed thanks to a system of contrasts, of affinities and differences among terms. The articulation of those contrasts would make possible the existence of semantic fields that could be escalated to what I provisionally could, would call here frames of concepts. Do you know anybody who is framed by these narratives? whose cognitive uh, experience and environment is uh, framed by these narratives. So to go back to the, to the first exercise, uh, who is P and who is Q, I would say here that for me, P is otherness and Q is narratives. So to take into account, again, otherness, we need to build new narratives that are inclusive and that also uh, are an extension and forge solidarity actions. And that's it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, dear Elizabeth, for this great presentation uh, and a very inspiring one as well. So we were not only able to um, to have a comparative look into different contexts in, in Latin America, uh, but also um, I would think a uh, an approach to to or a particular analytical approach to um, measure what has been discussed in previous lectures in this lecture series before. Uh, namely, how we can actually measure public communication and and draw conclusions out of this at a very very broad scale, right? And at the same time, at a very reliable scale. So uh, that was very deep and rich. And I would invite everyone in the audience, as always, to ask their question and participate in the discussion. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with uh, with how it works yet, you can simply in the lower right corner of your screen. Uh, click on uh, the icon with the two white arrows uh, and then uh, click on the speech bubble icon and then you can just type your um, your question. Oh, sorry, I just realized I forgot to uh, to enable you to type this question. So we'll do this right now while continuing speaking. Sorry for that. So as of right now, you should be able to ask your questions through the chat function, which I've just described. Just go down uh, to the lower right corner of the screen, click on the the two white arrows and pink ground, then click on the speech bubble and write and ask away. And in the meantime, uh, while you guys are writing, uh, I would like to ask one particular question to you, uh, dear Elizabeth, uh, in regards to um, what you said about uh, the situation in Brazil and, and Bolsonaro. Uh, I also found there was a very interesting and quite intriguing connection to some of the topics we had discussed in, in previous lectures here in regards to, to metaphors used in the crisis situation, right? So, um, and, and the whole ambivalence of some of the metaphors, one of the most common metaphors in all kinds of different different contexts would be the war and the fight metaphor, right? And I found this super intriguing that that uh, that uh, quotation by Bolsonaro, if I understood correctly, was Bolsonaro himself. Uh, this this uh, this motto, worse than being defeated, is not having fought, which is obviously, if I got it right, and it's Bolsonaro's own, uh, it's hard to beat in regards to cynicism, right? So uh, because there is nothing to fight, you could say if you die of the virus, well, how, how, how could you afford it, if not through through uh, through uh, social isolation measures, so to speak. Uh, so, so so that's an interesting, 
it, I, I would say it shows, say, the whole range, 360 degrees range almost, of of uh, what you can do with these uh, with these metaphors. I was wondering because you uh, at the end you refer to Saussure and and his notions or his definitions of semantic fields. I was wondering what role or if any role um, metaphors actually play for your research in like basing on this example, for instance. Yes, that is actually my my topic of my of my main research at the university. I would love. I love to refer to the metaphors also in this conference but they were approached by the first uh, by the first one the first lecture and, and because of the time but yes i would say that uh, the, the presence of mes of metaphors by, by in the in this uh, particular crisis in latin america is is very important mm. So metaphor is defined as uh, as providing a, a structure of a second order meaning, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and metaphors work in in, in in the many different scenarios as as a way to conceptualize uh, what well, the different, for example, topics or the different views uh, that we have about something. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that uh, linked to metaphors, but that don't uh, 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 work like metaphors, are in the lies. So, so we are we are full, we are filled, uh, or the virtual and the information is filled with lies, yeah, with fake news. So um, lies, as as one author that I, I like very much, that is Wolfgang Ether. Uh, I think that he was German. Uh, he, he says that that lies are also uh, or have also like a, a structure of second meaning, uh, mm -hmm. as well as the, as the, as fiction as metaphors. Uh, but the problem is that lies is that they don't uh, uncover the lie. They don't uncover what they, they what they are uh, hiding, while Fiction is is always in this in this in this um, it, it, like working in this uh, hiding and discovering uh, other options of meaning. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think that this correlation between uh, metaphors and the lies of fake fake news by uh, uh, politicians, for example, what is the role that that those play? Th those instances play in the in the public sphere in the video show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really that's really fascinating. Especially, I mean, then we could say that we have several layers of ambivalence or of uh, several dualism, so to speak. I mean, we have truth versus lie, but we also have the the whole range of meaning of metaphors that can really, I mean, one and the same metaphor can be used for in in opposite directions. Absolutely, like the fight metaphor, which we also know, a war metaphor, which we also know. Uh, in other in in opposite context like actually um actually justifying shutdown measures right that that is also meant to be a fight right everything can be a fight so to speak mm -hmm. right we have we have dualism so to speak at, at, at several layers there if you will so here comes uh, the first question from uh, from uh, the audience i will i will read it out uh, great presentation elizabeth i wonder what role does freedom of speech play in your research are there things which are unsayable or still unsayable another another really high-end topic in in current debates right and again i would i would if i if i may i would add again a, a case of of dualism or high ambivalence like if you look at famous infamous trump who defends demands freedom of speech for himself and at the same time tries to shut down Etc. Etc. So, so uh, what do you say, Elizabeth? So yes, in the in both of, in in the case of Cuba and in the case of uh, of Brazil, uh, both of them uh, refer to uh, freedom of expression, but uh, in Brazil. Um, for example, Bolsonaro says that the lockdown is also blocking the freedom of expression of people. And that is one more reason for people to be against the lockdowns and go uh, out to the streets to protest. 
Okay. Uh, so the next question goes maybe slightly off topic, not so much, I think, but I hope I, uh, you can say something about this topic. I was thinking about the pre-corona context in Latin America and that there were protests against the governments in many countries, such as Chile and Colombia, for instance. How does this work now with the lockdown? So how does it influence these movements of solidarity leading to them not being heard right now? Or are they still taking place online or simply excluded from the public sphere? In connection to the previous question, maybe to what extent is free speech still possible in uh, lockdown times? I think this is a very virulent topic indeed, right? What do you say, Elizabeth? Yeah, yeah thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, actually, I think that uh, my colleague Juan del Valle is going to approach the, the, the connection uh, among uh, the protests that took place in Chile before the lockdown and uh, what is happening with them right now. But uh, yes, uh, there is a, a question that regards to uh, what people can do during, the, during this lockdown uh, where they, when their lives, lives are uh, so controlled. Yes. Uh, but I, what I think is that uh, even though that the, the, the virtual space, not uh, the, the streets, for example, so they, are, they don't they don't cause so much attention. They are not provided so uh, so much attention. I would say that even though that uh, big difference, uh, I would say that the virtual is a, a great space to make new connections and to uh, support and to spread. Um, activism, for example. Uh, but I, I also think that it takes time. It will take time uh, for uh, these uh, social movements, for example, that take place in the virtual to be heard, but more people and to be, be heard by, by governments. So I, I think that that is actually also our, our, our job. To, to make those those protests or, or at least the contents of the protests protests uh, listen back more people yeah because uh, I was talking about inequalities and uh, of course Latin America is a is a space uh, of inequalities yeah it's much more of course than than in in Europe or in the USA even though we know now that in the USA because of what happened uh, inequalities are also uh, in in many in many places there. So um, because of that, because of inequalities, many people uh, don't have access, for example, to to, to these devices to be connected. Uh, for example, in Colombia, uh, there was published like a like a picture uh, with a guy with a, a guy, no, a, a kid in the countryside with a computer, but made by wood. So it was considered by the newspaper the most standard thing in the world, but of course it was not. It was just a reflection of the inequality. So people, peasants and the, the, the sons and daughters of, of peasants that are in a very poor, they really don't have any access to devices on the, and much less to the connections to the internet or something like that. So it was more than something tender that, oh, people, how creative are people. It was more romanticizing that, uh, as Vera, Vera said last, last week, it, it was more like the reflection of inequalities. So um, it is not easy that protesters are heard by many people, but also uh, it is also known that the virtual uh, is a very good place for spreading uh, social movements and activism. Yeah, I, I think that it just only takes time and the effort of many. Great, thank you. And the, the next question actually connects to the comparison Brazil uh, US. Uh, so I will, I will read out the next one, which takes it back to, well, basically also to the tweet that you showed beforehand with Bolsonaro and Trump. So the question reads, in the public debate, I have often read about alleged similarities between Bolsonaro and Trump. And I wonder how accurate these comparisons are. Would you, Elizabeth, say that Bolsonaro and Trump indeed have a similar political approach when it comes to COVID-19, in particular regarding narratives of exclusion and solidarity? Do you see any major differences? 
Right. Um, thank you for these questions. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I would say that they both have a very similar personality. <laughs> they are very narcissists. Um, they belong to uh, to the ultra right uh, position, political position. Um, they both are denying, for example, the how dangerous could be the virus that's why they, they are they are uh, they are saying that it is more important to save the economy because if we don't save the economy if they don't save the economy so they will they, that action would will actually kill more people than the virus uh, and at the same time they are, they are hiding uh, many many things that they they have uh, skipped to do in their own countries like the creation of, of uh, social policies uh, to cover to cover not but uh, to eliminate to eradicate uh, at some uh, until some point uh, inequalities uh, we know that it is not going to be uh, one solution in, in a in a same time of four years or eight years there, there can be uh, like uh, actions taken by the the leaders of the countries, and in particular, this, uh, both of these leaders, uh, Bolsonaro and, and, and Trump, are, are, are just uh, trying to um, make people, they are populists in, in one word. Both of them are populists, and their view is very, very uh, linked, is what I could say right now. Great, thanks so much, uh, dear Elizabeth. I also see for those uh, who are in the live audience that our uh, chair associate member Jacqueline has, uh, Jacqueline Fox has posted a very interesting link to an article with further information on the lockdown situation in Chile. So everyone who's interested in that, please just, uh, just click on that link. And I also see uh, that the uh, thank yous and congratulations are already popping in in the chat. I hope you can see that too, dear Elizabeth. Um, because obviously some of our, our colleagues are now heading over to the other presentation uh, I, I mentioned at the beginning of, of this lecture. So uh, thank you once more, dear Elizabeth. This was really a fantastic uh, and, and really deep insight into the situation in some American, South American, Latin American countries uh, in, in these regards. And we can see, like taking together also your responses to the questions, how complex the situation, the situations one should write for this day are, uh, and how uh, how careful we must be in our in our analysis and also speaking from from the European or European studies context in in judgments, be it the use of particular metaphors or or being the uh, be it the um, the evaluation of an overall risk or of of uh, the the um, say the, the balancing between different values and so on, that we don't remain too Eurocentric in that regard, because we can clearly see uh, in these discussions like how how much how how how, how different really uh, the, the the power relations and and the, uh, the the problems relations between different problems and aspects and areas can can actually be. So thank you so much again, dear uh, Elizabeth, and thank you all for participating in uh, in the discussions there are more and more congratulations and thank yous in in the chat for you um and yeah i would uh, add another thank you to our dear colleague vera alexander who um who helped you, uh, with the moderation um uh, today and with the participant management and uh, yeah please guys everyone don't forget to tune back in next week uh, then with a another lecture from the Latin American context as uh, previously announced. All details can be found as always on our uh, website. And uh, for now, I uh, would wish you all to stay healthy, stay well uh, throughout this coming week and see you again soon. Thank you very much. Again, Thank you very much. Have a good day.
Take care, guys. Goodbye. Bye.